So tree acquisition is, is probably uh, significant. Here's a man working out a small, uh, one of these small light canoes. This is sort of good. I don't think this is, this is from Puget Sound, but this is the sort of canoe that a woman would use uh, for working around through wetlands and filling it with water roots and other kinds of things. Man as well, small fish, anybody, small kid. I was thinking about painting and then one that I showed you. And then this man is edging out the interior of the small canoe. Again, you can see people edging stuff out uh, in the carving shed, carving tent. And everybody on the coast made canoes, but people on the Queen Charlotte's and people on the West Coast of Maine Cooper Island specialized in them and exported hulls, particularly very big canoes, really big hulls often came from here because they had two things. One, they had big trees, big cedars, which are present elsewhere. We have them here. But the big cedars here, one, were very numerous. And second of all, when you brought one down, it was easy to get into water to bring it down to the shore where you could work with it. So the, the, the big trees grew very close where they could be turned into canoes. Um, and so that, for example, the macaw, the famous whalers, all the, the big whaling canoes actually came from here, and they were the hulls were brought down. These folks supplied Clingit less often co-simption with really big hulls in exchange, in this case, with fish oil. These guys got whale oil there. And then this is Bill, Bill Reed. Bill Reed is a major uh, painter in Northwest Coast Scenes. And you see the ads mark. So they're doing the final step where you have to you put water in the, hull, in, the, in the dugout and then you steam it and then you bend the dugout to shape. So if you go and look at the really elegant version of one of these out there, you'll see how it's shaped. And that shape traditionally would be done by bending the boat out. You can imagine the skill it would take to do that right. Uh, there are problems with these boats, as elegant as they are. One is that they have to be kept wet. Uh, if you park one on the beach and you go out and wet it or cover it up with something wet. The other one is that sometimes the hulls would fail. There would be a hidden flaw in the wood and it would pop open. You know, you're 10 miles off the coast here, off the bar, and your boat pops open. Uh, so you want your canoe maker to be really, really skilled and good at judging the hull all the way through the process. Also, these things last in maybe 10 to 15 years. So if you have hundreds of canoes, then you're in constant, constantly making new ones. Probably ongoing canoe making. It's not a special event. It was constant. So, how do we find canoes archaeological? Well, direct evidence is like in Florida, where there's been a drought and lake levels have fallen, and, and, and dugout canoes pop out of the lake shore, lake floor. Uh, that's never happened along the West Coast. Uh, it happens in Europe sometimes, really cold waters. Also in Japan, but we've never had, and I know of, I've never seen a report for a dugout canoe, a canoe showing up uh, that way here. So we use proxy evidence. Um, one form is people were, they couldn't get otherwise, so people in Australia, uh, sometime actually, it could be late early, 75,000, but there's no way to get to Australia except by boat. There's about a 50 mile span, you can't, you have to cross the boat. So even at 50,000 to 75,000 years ago, people had boats to get there. So we know they're there. So in Alaska, we have people and goods and places that have always been uh, islands, even during glacial periods. And so we know that they have to have some kind of boat uh, on the West Coast. Uh, other proxy evidence, and this is what I was, is again in Prince Rupert Harbor, Northern BC. And there are a couple forms of evidence. Uh, we're going to go out here very quickly. Give us a look back at the harbor. And this is heading out of a small boat to those islands that are about 15 kilometers out. And these are sites, archaeological sites, and places that are accessible only by boat. Uh, going back at least to 9,000 years ago. So we have people in places they have to have to do things. And this is, oops, this is an example of one of those sites where they're collecting shell, processing shell, like that young woman in the painting I showed you. And then we have villages, that's those examples. We have villages on small islands, which again are accessible only by boat. And these are important. The other two sites, the other sites that I showed you could be small pastures. But these are villages, large villages, several hundred people that have to be provisioned and whatnot and supported. And they're on an island. The only way to do that is by boat. The only way they're going to be fed is These look like they're in the middle of the island, but actually sea levels are much higher here when they were occupied. So they would have been on small points of land or even islands at the time uh, that they were occupied. So 
uh, when the village was thoroughly addressed, this is my friend years ago, and they would require boats in order for them to function as well. And another piece of proxy evidence are canoe skids, where uh, you bring the boats, boats in, you need to clear the rocks off the beach so you can get them in without damage in the hull, and you just pile rocks up on your side, so you have what are called the canoe slides or canoe skids. <coughs> tell you that they're there. Well, my favorite piece of evidence, proxy evidence, is this little island in Fisher Harbor right here. The circle is called Garden Island. This is where I did my dissertation work, so I'm sort of fond of it in any case. But and here's a map of it. It was a village between about 2,300 years ago and, and when uh, Europeans entered the harbor. And here are the Skanuskis, multiple Skanuskis, for good reason. It's got no water. We've got a village of two, three, four hundred people and no fresh water. Now they may have they probably have boxes out, they probably have ways of capturing this place gets a lot of rain, capturing the rain. But if you're going to consistently provision and support a village in a place with no fresh water, you're going to be hauling in water and use waterproof boxes in canoes. So that's what I mean by proxy evidence. So on the West Coast here, there have been boats for at least eleven thousand years. And probably a hide boat, like this Inuit or uh, Eskimo Uniac. You hard to find evidence, direct evidence of this for the kind of boat. Uh, and then dugouts, the tools that I showed you appear in the record after about 5,500 years ago. And then really large, heavy duty versions of those tools appear about 1,500 years ago, which leads me to wonder if maybe the smaller, the small boats and medium sized boats, dugouts, began perhaps around 5,500 or later, but the really big 60-footers may have been, they started producing those after about 1,500 years ago. I don't know that, but that's, that's sort of my theory, my own theory. So back to Lewis and Clark and Captain Fogel, this gives you, here's that, in the painting, here's that, that uh, motif on that one, you know, burial canoe, here's another one. So this brings you back to this painting with enormous numbers of canoes, all of which had to be made and produced, the, the, the tree cell filled with material which is coming into the site, the materials which are going out of the site for excursion. So this, I think, gives you a sense, a nice sense of the village of all of its canoes. And then in closing, this is a painting of a freight canoe or a war canoe that I stuck in. I found this on the web, and I was just kind of going by it when I was looking, and I saw that the boats down here are local style, lower river style boats. I was like, huh? I have to go back and track this down and see what it is. It has the sort of life on the Mississippi quality to it. This is another painting by Bill Reed, the Chinook Man in a little boat out somewhere on the lower river. It's called Easy Morning. And I'd seen somehow put the centrally relaxed. Another thing about canoes is this sort of guy out drifting out from India off the Baker Bay and a little bit of around the And then this is another building painting called First Sail, man out fishing or spearing fish, seeing one of the sailing ships for the first time. And that brings us out to today's Chinook people. Uh, and the canoe actually puts out front. And that's it. Well, any questions?